I'm starting to fuel again. No, they're uh, all pumped. They're all pumped and full. Yeah. Yeah. So not, they're all after the after the leak was a, so maybe they're not that delayed, but it'll be a while. Okay, we're live. Okay. Um, well, welcome to um, a presentation on the YouTube channel, of San Diego Iron Space Museum. Uh, my name is Jim Kidrick. I'm the president and CEO of the museum. Uh, we have with us uh, Mark Larson, the chairman of the board, uh, and Milt Windler and Jerry Griffin, uh, two of what uh, we would consider the uh, legacy flight directors, uh, you know, driving us through uh, as far back as Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs, uh, and of course, really highlighted in the Apollo uh, missions and uh, to the moon. So, uh, they're going to be our our, our experts uh, who have done this uh, literally hundreds of times, and who are very very aware of uh, of the the challenges of launching anything into space. Uh, we also have with us our uh, PR marketing uh, uh, representative David Neville uh, from the museum. Uh, Ruben Goulart uh, is uh, uh, running our technology today. So if it screws up, I want you to remember his name. Send the email. Uh, in care of Ruben and uh, and Grayson Grove and Grayson is uh, is another one of our board members. So, uh, Milt and Jerry, why don't you guys just do a very very quick intro? Uh, but both of you have been lead flight directors on Apollo missions, uh, and and of course certainly many many um, uh, uh, the involvement didn't uh, didn't end there because Jerry at one time you were of course Johnson Space Center director. And uh, so just give us a very quick and dirty before we get this puppy in the air. Okay, you want me to go first? Sure. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I got into the space program uh, in the early 60s uh, after serving in the Air Force, uh, Air, also Air Defense Command, and, uh, and immediately got into Gemini because Gemini, uh, Mercury had just finished as I got there. And um, so I was in the control room for all of, all of uh, the Gemini program. And then uh, uh, after we had the fire on Apollo 1, uh, then our, our chief on show in flight control was Chris Kraft and Chris decided he needed three more flight directors so he reached out and plucked me and and uh, Milt and, and a fellow named Pete Frank and uh, we've rounded out the six person that was made us six that did all of the Apollo missions one phase or another and uh, it was a great it was a great job I, I later went on to do other things for NASA and headquarters and it dried out in the desert and Kennedy and finally got back to JSC as the center director. Um, I have to say the best job I ever had in my life was being a flight director though. It was, it was a, it was a tremendous job in those Apollo years, particularly. Hmm. Okay. Milt. Well, I started off when I graduated from Virginia Tech in 1954 working for NACA. And I was working on propeller research at the time, high speed propeller research on an F 88B, which was a plane that never made it into service. Anyway, and before I got through in 20 years, I'd gone from propellers to landing on the moon. That was a. <laughs> I was kind of, I didn't realize that until I started thinking about some of those dates. You just keep working on stuff and uh, and it happens, I guess you could say. But uh, I, I, like Jerry says, I, I came in uh, when after the fire. And uh, when I got there, I, I had not worked with the flight control people very much. I was working in recovery and working on location aids primarily with the aircraft that were telling us where where the spacecraft was starting with mercury and uh when i got there they said milt who and uh, <laughs> but they, they they did treat me uh reasonably nice i think and uh and it was a, a fun thing i went on through skylab which was a really interesting program i always liked that because uh 
when we got to Skylab, we were delivering a product, not just going there and landing and coming back, which we kind of did at the end of Apollo, but nothing like what's happening now up on the space station. And uh, but in Skylab was uh, early version of the space station, and we uh, put a ton of data down. I don't. I, I wonder sometimes if they ever looked at all of that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they did, but 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 it was overwhelming to me anyway. And, hey Jerry, uh, and, and, a question for you about about some history here. Thinking about milestones, uh, Gemini, the last Gemini mission ended on today, 1966, splashdown. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, Jim Lovell, Gemini 12. Uh, your thoughts about that? Because that was the, the last of that phase, stepping to Apollo, to the moon, and all the big things yet to come. So what was going on in, in your mind and others at that time on this evening, uh, six years ago? Uh, that's, good. that's a good question, because uh, the Gemini program actually taught us how to go to the moon. It, it was... It's the first time we had ever docked anything. I can remember, and Milt, you were uh, in recovery, but you probably, I remember we talked about rendezvous and docking. Boy, that was going to be really hard. It turned out to be pretty easy, as a matter of fact. We've never blown one. Um, and in fact, Dave Scott told me when they, right after Gemini 8, when they rendezvoused with an Agena, and a, yeah. a piece of cake. He said the, the rendezvous was simple. They had a later problem, but yeah. but uh, and and it's the first time we did an EVA, uh, and the guys just early on were flailing around because we learned you had to have foot restraints and hand holds that fit what you were trying to do, and. Um, and move slowly and carefully, and it was a lot easier than trying to do it real fast. So rendezvous and docking and, and EVAs and that kind of thing, it, we really got grounded in that in, during uh, the yeah. Gemini program. So we, we kind of had that behind us. At least we knew we could do it um, when we started Apollo. So it's very important. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing to know, follow up on that because uh, thinking about the time and you think about the Apollo moon missions and how leading up to July 1969 it was like every other month the accelerated pace now it seems like this is the third third time's a charm for Artemis tonight um, obviously more time in between and so forth but it was go go back in those days so here 56 years ago tonight Gemini 12 six years later we're almost done with Apollo in December 70. Yeah. For, for Apollo 17, which, by the way, as you know, but I don't know if our viewers know, that was the only Apollo night launch. And here we are waiting for a night early night launch. Launch, coast launch, which is going to be pretty cool with Artemis today. Yeah, you, we probably need we probably need to warn people that, uh, um, well, not warn, but just advise <laughs> them that, that a night launch is something else. It looks kind of like uh, looking at an arc uh, welder uh, yeah. without your hood on. Uh, it's very, very bright, and uh, but they're spectacular. Yeah, we did do that on 17. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I'd, I'd like to throw in something on Gemini that has always impressed me. I thought that the, we had a hard time with the suits in Gemini because I don't think we appreciated what the workload was going to be, and, and we overloaded the Gemini suits quite a bit, and they had a hard time. Hmm. But, and that never happened in Apollo. I think they took the lessons from Gemini and put them into the Apollo suit and made that EVA and, and the lunar operations all uh, work. Right. And, and, and that was a, probably a bigger, it, it, was a, it was a thing that was hard, especially compared to the rendezvous, as you just said, Jerry. Uh, yeah. it, it, it always impressed me as I thought back on it. Yeah. You know, the other one other thing, Jim, we we flew uh, long enough on, I think it was five uh, to get to the moon and back. Ah. Yeah, that was uh, that was Borman and and Conrad and Conrad. No, was wasn't it? Uh, or maybe. No, it was Borman, wasn't it? I can't remember. Maybe it was Lovell. But anyhow. <laughs> 
I know it was not <laughs> a lot of I thought I, I thought that Lovell came back saying it was really fun being in it for eight days or something like that with, with Frank. But yeah, okay. it was Lovell. They didn't smell so good. Yeah, the air was a little ripe. Remember <laughs> the frog yeah. and, when the frog not <laughs> open the canopy. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's dedication. <laughs> but I interrupted you, Jerry. I'm sorry. I, oh, I no, no, that's you. okay. It's just that we flew a long mission, which was at least we knew we could stay in space that long and uh, and survive. So that's another lesson we learned from uh, from Gemini. Well, you it, know, looking... It, 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 it might be good to just reintroduce people tuning in and, and all that uh, here at the, at the museum and and what we're doing here tonight, but then also give a, a bit of a status report because we're about to enter the launch window, which is delayed a little bit. So maybe an update uh, from the stats desk. So uh, I haven't heard because I'm just seeing the channel come back up on Got the screen fixed here. Before leaving the launch pad and sure. uh, then uh, launch team verifying that that work was complete. Right. Now, currently we're awaiting some work with the range. Uh, the 45th Space Wing, which oversees the range here and makes sure that uh, the airspace and, uh, and uh, the ocean out over the flight path is clear and also has the responsibility to destruct the rocket should it go uh, off track. Uh, they have been working on some issues with their equipment and sending a flight termination signal to the rocket. That, that, uh, uh, there is testing that must happen with the flight termination system that was delayed by a bad Ethernet switch. Switch has been changed out, and now uh, the range is looking to start testing their connectivity to the rocket uh, in order to preserve that uh, safety function uh, that they are responsible for. So again, we are slipping now indefinitely into the launch window. Um, we're awaiting uh, the uh, launch team to evaluate just how much time is required to complete the work to get this rocket ready to launch. And of course, when we have a new T-0 for you, we'll report that out right away. Megan, back to you. I, I, I admire the term right away. Yeah. And then and maybe right away would have been, <laughs> here it is. But yeah. uh, so, so Milton, Jerry, you know, having gone through, uh, you know, what you've gone you know, these many, many years. Um, and now here we are, you know, Artemis one, two, and three, which this is really kind of a, you know, a trifecta that we're looking at the third one, actually walking back onto the moon and, uh, you know, describe what you guys think the significance of this is, because, you know, there's lots of, you know, whether it's defense, you know, whether it's uh, regaining, um, deep space leadership, you know, which uh, we and the United States have had for many, many years. Um, you know, what do you guys say? You've had more conversations with all of the astronauts, other flight directors, the, uh, you know, the, you know, the flight direction teams uh, that you've been members of, you know, where are we, what, what are we doing? Where are we going? you will go first one. I mean, <laughs> I was just going to say, one of the things that we're going to get out of this, I believe, is, and I hope we do, is an ex, uh, experience in flying more in deep space. Uh, they, they don't go anywhere near as far as Mars, but at least the loop past the, uh, the moon gets you out there where you're exposed to the radiation, which is probably going to be the biggest problem in going to Mars. And uh, if we ever want to do that and I guess we do someday so uh, that that was one thing that kind of impressed me when I looked at the at the mission uh, profile uh, the rest of it is stuff we've really done before Jerry right and I, and right I, well and yeah. I think you're right we're reproving a lot of things uh, because uh, didn't the Orion capsule start out at seven? And then, you know, went back to six to five to four. Uh, and um, so, uh, yeah, you know, I think, I think it was up to seven when it started. Right. right. Yeah. I think it was going to be yeah. crowded. Yeah. yeah talking, about, talking about some of the milestones of history, I think back to 1968 with Apollo 8 with a crew. Here's Artemis ready to do a big deal to the moon. First time we've done it in, in so long. 
And the goal, obviously, without the crew is to, in, in many ways, you know, Jim Kidrick, you pointed this out, it, it, it feels a lot like Apollo 8 without the people of the, this round. And then there's a, it's a different kind of an arc. Too. Once it's around the moon, there's a different, it's different Thank duration. You. The splashdown is going to be here off San Diego with the Orion capsule uh, after several days. But uh, what about some of the similarities there? And, and again, Jerry and Milt as flight directors at NASA through all those times. What it comes to what are you thinking about when you when you see this? Again, so much time has gone from say December of seventy two or, or sixty eight with Apollo eight. Well, one of the main differences, it's obvious, is the the fact that in in Apollo. Uh, we flew in Earth orbit before we went to the moon. Uh, this flight, this mission tonight, uh, first flight is going to the moon. Mm -hmm. um, and now we didn't, you know, we that first flight, we just orbited the moon and they're going to orbit here. But it's the first flight of the rocket, first flight of the spacecraft. So that is yeah. really a, a giant step. And, and I've, you know, as I've gotten uh, more mature, I'll use that term, uh, <laughs> I've, I've come to a conclusion that I think the, the best thing we are handing over from Apollo to Artemis is the fact that we did it. Um, mm -hmm. And when we started Apollo, it had never been done. And we thought we could do it and we had, and we did, but it wasn't a sure thing. And I've told the folks down at JSC, I think the thing, cause they keep asking me or telling me, you know, we're standing on your shoulders. And I said, yeah, mainly because we did it. And we proved that you could put all this hardware together and hold it together and, and put enough software in it to make it run. You guys are going to have, I told them, I said, you guys are going to have a lot better uh, technology to deal with, but you still got to do what we did 50 years ago. And that's just make it all hold together, particularly in the launch phase. That The launch phase that we're going to see tonight, I think, is so dynamic and has so many moving parts and separations of stages and and panels blowing off and and uh, so it, it, it can be very easy to, to go wrong. And uh, I think Artemis, uh, it's, uh, I hope they get this thing off tonight. We, they need a success and that'll get their mojo uh, going. And, uh, but I think uh, Artemis is on the right track if we can sustain it. Because then if, very, if it all goes well, then the next round, Artemis II, is with the crew. And then the third well, time, yeah. Artemis three is, is landing and the first person of color, first woman on the moon, which uh, I keep saying is listed as like the top thing. But all of this steps to Mars and beyond and everything else, the big picture things. Uh, Bill Nelson, the former senator, who's also the NASA administrator, as you know, was also a shuttle astronaut. Very optimistic. I was just looking at some comments from a couple of hours ago. Um, you know, feeling everything's good. And they talk about the scrubs we had for the last two attempts at this particular mission. And he says, hey, when, once you go, you, you forget about the scrubs because you guys know there were a lot of scrubs. You, a lot of you, did. you don't exactly go, oh, it was five or, what, five or six times, I think, in some cases with some shuttles. So what about that? Because yeah, we're listening to this, the, the frustration now, they, they fixed the leak issue, it appears, and then they got something in the down downrange tracking with an ethernet component. <laughs> so you're like, but, but that happened. But no matter how good you are. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I, I think the, uh, what we've seen uh, so far in Artemis, uh, they couldn't catch a break. It's kind of like the team that uh, almost uh, wins and, and they uh, can't catch a break. Two bad storms and, and, uh, and now we're hung up with a, with a rain safety, which is very important. Uh, I don't mean to, uh, to to make it sound simple, but a very important uh, step. And, and the weather's good. Right. It looks good. looks like the weather's good, like 90% good weather, a little bit. Oh, they're of, good. They're good. Yeah. Right, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, because earlier they had one of the radars that, you know, wasn't quite operating, one of the trackers and, and things like that. But, you know, um, 
you know, as we go forward and, uh, you know, let's, let's, uh, you know, let's lift this, uh, this thing up, you know, uh, you know, off the pad. Okay. Talk about TLI, talk about, you know, all that takes place once it gets airborne. That's okay. translunar injection for those of you watching at home. Well, I'm going to let them explain that, Mark, because they're the experts. So he will interpret all that. And uh, Jerry and I have discussed this already. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, uh, but, but, you know, there's a lot happening and uh, you know, the suspense certainly of the launch itself, but once it gets airborne, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that has to happen before it heads that way. And maybe the two of you could describe that. Yeah, maybe since you and I, uh, let me start it and then Milt, tell me where, where I've missed some. Um, this vehicle is, is, it's built different than the set, the Saturn, uh, considerably. Um, we had three stages in Saturn. They really only, uh, there's three if you count the solid rockets, but, uh, but it was all one stack. And to do, we did translunar injection after about a revolution, a little more. And we, we injected, used an engine, actually the third state in, engine, we've restarted. And so it was a big push. And that burn in Apollo lasted, I looked it up today, uh, just short of six minutes um, on average. 17 was 546 and eight was a little little longer, about 10 seconds. Um, what we're gonna see tonight or what they're, what's gonna happen is uh, they separate and it exposes an engine they call the ICPS, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage. It's a variant, it's a playoff of a Delta second stage. And it's only one engine, an RL-10. That burn for, to get to up to velocity to escape the Earth and head for the moon takes 18 minutes. We never burned an engine 18 minutes in Apollo. Um, but it's just not much shoving on it. And so it's a very long burn. That, that's got to that's gotta be like, uh, you know, you could read a short novel if, if, you, uh, if, you, if you had the in front of you. I, I really think the, uh, the system though is, it looks after that, it looks a lot like Apollo. There's a service module and it's got an engine to go into lunar orbit. And, um, but we're gonna have to, it, it, that translunar injection happens about two hours after liftoff. Um, so it's a, it takes a while to get ready for it and uh, expose that final, oh, in the meantime too, they also deploy the solar panels on the, uh, on the service module. Mm -hmm. So they get it ready to go. So it's a busy time in there. And then there's that humongous long burn um, of that one RL-10 engine. When they go to the next block of engines, that's going to be four RL-10s on what they call the EUS, the exploration upper stage. And then that TLI will be much shorter, uh, that, that translunar injection burn. And uh, so that's that's... That's what we're going to see tonight. It's about what we saw in Apollo, except the stages were different. So Artemis II, the SLS will have the four? No. Okay. No, it's still going to... The, the first four flights are all that interim cryogenic stage. Using the one? Yeah, using the one engine. Got it. And, th and then it goes to the EUS after that. Can I say one that... Uh, the one thing I looked looked at today that is very interesting and I know they've covered it on the commentary here lately. Um, the engines at the bottom of that core stage where the bottom where the the orange tank ends and those there's four engines down there. All of those engines came out of the shuttle and um, they were the 
I think it's the RS-25. And the engine and number one flew four on four shuttle launches. On number two, it was four shuttle missions. Engine three flew six shuttle missions. And then engine four uh, only flew three times, but it flew the last mission, SDS-135. So those engines, you know, we talk about reusability and we, you know, I'm not taking anything away from the commercial people. Those guys have figured out how to put a, a whole stage back on the ground. Uh, and it's, it's amazing to me, but, you know, the, the shuttle orbiter was reusable. That piece of the shuttle that looked like the airplane was reusable. The engines were refurbed and flown several times, as we've said. And now they've got 16 of those shuttle engines left. The first four flights are going to all be prior shuttle engines. And then they run out of them. They build new ones. Uh, but my point is, uh, we've actually gotten to some reusability, even in in uh, Artemis. Even, that we even in NASA. Yeah, even <laughs> in NASA. Hey, hey, Jerry, let me ask you about this since you're talking the shuttle. Wait, wait, wait. Line. Hold on, Mark. Hold on, Mark. Just a sec. Let's go oh, to yeah. Milt. Okay, Milt. Yeah. You know, Remember, we've got a base question here, and you know we've just launched. Okay, and Milt, what did you used to watch the most? You know, you know, getting to TLI and getting to you know heading towards the moon. Well, like Gary said, we were going to relight the uh, upper last stage of the Saturn to get on up and to get into uh, translunar injection. You're looking at the spacecraft uh, pretty carefully to be sure that nothing is going wrong with it. And and it, when Jerry was flying uh, Apollo 12, which was struck by lightning, and that was a kind of a interesting proposition to to try to convince yourself that nothing was wrong with all those systems. And you know, we had what you just put one more orbit in there. I think Jerry is that right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so you, instead of one orbit, you had two, but another 90 minutes to, to look at it. But uh, but that's uh, kind of tricky to do. And 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 you but you got guys that can do that and that the systems guys that can uh, look at what's going on there as long as they've got the data. Now, for a while there, we didn't have data in the. Uh, 12, but but there was time enough to look at it. And that's what we got to do, I think, here in, in this mission, uh, is to be sure that the systems are, uh, spacecraft systems are all uh, in there and doing the normal thing. We had really pretty good results, I think, from the, from the command module and service module on all the Apollo missions. We didn't really have much trouble with those. Uh, eight, nine, 11, everything was pretty much ops normal. And even 12 after, after it got you know, pulled together and you got the instrumentation back, it, yeah. I don't think it was any, any residual damage from that lightning strike. 12 was the cleanest you. mission we had after that lightning strike. And we got everything squared away. Had fewer discrepancies than any other mission. Massive reset. Yeah, I guess that's what you uh, need. You need a lightning jolt to get all those systems <laughs> woke up and right. get them going. That's right. But uh, I, that when 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 they landed and you could see that uh, surveyor in the background, that was impressive. Yeah. And, and yeah. a lot of that right. came from Germany, as you said. Uh, Jerry, uh, the experience on Gemini in, yeah. in, in, in trajectory determination and so forth. So, uh, you know, there's that old classic question, you know, on, on um, you know, what you guys did as flight directors, you know, uh, because a lot of this is, is very, very similar, especially, you know, the flights that we're, uh, that we're watching, uh, uh, hopefully we'll watch the first one tonight, you know, what kept you awake? at night, what did you worry about the most, you know, through those, we'll say Gemini and Apollo years? 
That's, that's an interesting question. You, you know, I'm not I'll, sure I can. I'll, while you're thinking about that, Jerry, I'll say that I must be trusting or something because I really didn't worry. I don't think I stayed up worrying about things. I, I, I felt like people were doing their jobs and it was, uh, was going to happen. I was going to say this exactly the same thing, Mel. I, I, I don't think I ever worried too much about it. It was always uh, interesting and <laughs> kind of fun, but I can remember, I think the thing that, that made the difference, and this, all of you that fly machines will know what I'm saying, was our training, our simulations, uh, got us ready in a way that is, is hard to describe. We, you know, we would end a mission and two or three days later, um, we would be simulating the next mission. And it was hours and hours and hours of simulation and training. And it was kind of just, it was in our DNA that we could handle things. And so even Apollo 13, although it was a little bit of a cliffhanger until we understood what we had, um, I, I had a hard time staying away from the control center because I didn't want to miss anything, but I wasn't needed <laughs> all of that time. And it would, it would, uh, it, it, it was kind of, that's what we were trained to do. And, and so it kind of came naturally. And some, you know, we didn't have many, we didn't have anybody that I remember that get, got, well, it may be one or two, got removed from the control center. Um, we did have some that self eliminated because they didn't like the pressure. Most of us that were left that flew, by the time we got to first few flights of Apollo, the challenge and the and it's what made us tick. We, we, um, that's what, what we wanted. We wanted it. Uh, we knew it was tough and it was, you could, you could get some guys killed real easy, but it was what we liked. It was, and we didn't mind, mind making decisions being out there on the end of the diving board and kind of looking around. There's nobody else to make the decision. You got to make it. So it was an uh, interesting time that I, don't, I didn't worry too much. Uh, um, Even during Apollo 13, which was a lot going on and everything, people ask sometimes, you know, well, were you afraid you weren't going to get the crew back? And I think after a short period of time, as Jerry said, uh, we thought nobody, everybody was of the opinion we could do something to bring them back, and, and there wasn't any any uh, any great problems. I mean, there were problems, but it, there was nothing yeah. insurmountable. And and we had people working on all of them, and most of them were coming to us and saying, "Hey, here's something we got to do, like you know, like the CO two uh, build up." They dramatize that in the movie, but it, it wasn't that dramatic in, in real life, I didn't think. No. Yeah. Gentlemen, we should give an update for people who may be coming in and out of the, of the broadcast here of the San Diego Air and Space Museum YouTube channel. Appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. They're thinking, hey, we're into the launch window. What's going on? They had a 30-minute hold, and we're still kind of waiting for a NASA update where they'll, they'll give us some new uh, estimated launch time, that's that's still pending. They've been working on a downrange issue, but they're making progress on all these things. We just don't know when. We're in the window of about a couple of hours. Uh, so uh, we'll, we're, we're all really hoping this this works. I want to go back to the question that I wanted to ask Jerry. When you, Jerry, you were talking about some of the recycled parts. And, and by the way, I'm Mark Larson, chairman of the museum. Jim Kidrick, the CEO and president. Uh, this is his brainchild to come on. And this is our third time we've done with the other earlier you know, postponements, the scrubs. And of course, we have the legendary flight uh, controllers here who saw it all through the pioneering days at NASA, Milt Wendler and Jerry Griffin. Uh, Gene Kranz uh, is not able to be with us tonight, but uh, he's given us some, some input uh, 
uh, sends his best. And uh, he's told us some great stories on the other broadcasts uh, as well. But talking about the the engines, we were t- the shuttle engines that get used again for Artemis, because, you know, one of those scrubs, um, at least one, there was one involving an engine issue. And a lot of the Twitter chatter was, was okay, why this is a whole new program. Why are they recycling? Well, you talked about the environmental re- reusability. There's also budgets. But yeah, here's a shuttle. So if you look at the backside of, of the, you know, in terms of the rocket itself and the solid rocket boosters, at first glance, it kind of feels like Artemis. But here's, so here's, here's the orbiter. So Jerry, the engines you're talking about that are on Artemis, explain where they are. They, they're, they're not they're the right at the back of that orbiter, right where it's black. Yep. Yeah. So that's where they are. Yep. And, and there's, so they, there's like legacy engines on this flight when it goes. Look at it that, that way. Would- you know, they take the, they took those engines off occasionally, you know, they would take them yeah. and refurb them, make sure everything was lubed yeah. up <laughs> and uh, change the oil, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, that's what they did in this case. They went back and, and uh, refurbed them all and made sure the seals were good. And, and you know, they re- re- kept reflying them in the shuttle and they, they worked fine. So uh, really, really, really. Well, another thing that's interesting talking about uh, all these anniversaries, Gemini 12 uh, splashdown today, um, the Apollo 17, December 1972, almost the 50th anniversary. And of course, Apollo 8 and 68. A lot of people said, well, we've been there, done that. We beat the Russians. Uh, we still got our hands full with Russia and Putin. We're, you know, we've been renting s- seats to get to the space station. At least now we have alternatives with uh, some of the other uh, competitive companies. But now it's a it's a space race with China. In fact, Bill Wilson, the administrator of NASA, was talking about that today and on Meet the Press the other day. What about that? Are things everything old is new again, or or what? There's plenty of people busy in space beyond us. Oh yeah, the Chinese, uh, uh, the Soviets, or the Russians are still at it, um, and I think we're still in the lead right now. But I think the Chinese are doing some really good things and, and they're good at it. Um, I don't think we can ever say that, that that will be easy to stay with them or stay ahead of them. We're going to have to work at it. Um, I think it can be done. Um, but the thing that, that uh, you know, when we, when we talk about why are we doing Artemis, um, I think it's all about sustainability, uh, some permanence, some habitability on the moon. That, and, and the reason that's important because it'll give us uh, an opportunity to know what we got to do it in deeper space, uh, mm-hmm. Mars or even beyond. Uh, that someday we're going to, and I've got my own theory on that. I think the reason we need to do this is we need to learn how to move around in deep space. And the reason, and it may be a thousand years from now or 5,000 years or 10,000 years, we may have to get off this planet for the human species to survive. And I'm not talking about global warming. I'm talking about resources, using up the resources, the basic resources that are here. Now that sounds far out and it's, and I know it's a, it's a long way off, but it's going to take a while, not only to find other places in our universe, and we're not going to find it in our solar system, that hmm. may be habitable. Now, if we don't want the species to survive, that'd be okay. Then we'll hmm. just blow it off and let it in. But if we do, we need to learn how to travel in deep space and stay there. Um, and so I, I, I think Artemis is what we did in Apollo is a little teeny step like this. And then what we're going to do in Artemis is another teeny step. Even when we go to Mars, it's not a huge step because that's what 140 million miles away. Um, but it's in our solar system. So we're, I think the country's on the right track here. And I think that's why the Chinese are doing it. Basically, I think it's why everybody thinks about space as being 
a potential future. Uh, well, there's for also generations long after we're gone. You know, Bill Nelson said uh, this was on Meet the Press. This struck me because I, at first I've seen him talk more specifically about this as the NASA administrator. He said, "We're in a space race. We want to get to the South Pole of the Moon where the resources are." And we don't want China suddenly getting there and saying, this is our exclusive territory. So a lot of that sounds like the old Russian days. It's that they've got a lot more backing it up, a lot more technology now to make that more, if anything, probably more urgent for us. Right. I agree. Yeah. That Milt? was a lot more ramble. I just... <laughs> no, good. Mine. Milt, what Mine. Do you think? Well, I think that uh, certainly many people agree with uh, you because they're uh, there, there's just so many reasons that we need to be in space. You know, the exploring um, and pioneering nature that we have as a people certainly, uh, you know, comes into play that we want to know what's out there. Uh, and, and, and I think that's very important, certainly. And, and of course, the, uh, the new uh, telescopes that are, uh, that are out in space are giving us a look at things we've never, ever seen before. Uh, which is certainly very exciting, uh, you know, every so often. And I know, Jerry, you and I have talked about it. You know, um, we're looking for four people just to go. You know, we, they're not going to come back. They're just going to go. They'll keep transmitting as long as they possibly can, surviving as long as they can. Uh, you know, just with that last uh, yell out there, we found it, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, you know, so I think that's very exciting. But certainly um, the nature of, of uh, our defense forces having access to uh, space as other nations that aren't always friendly is, is certainly comes into the equation and is, is very very important. Uh, you know that we have uh, uh, that we have some. I'm not necessarily saying dominance, but we have significant presence. You know, in deep space, and as uh, as both uh, you and Milt have said, um, it's important that we learn to operate out there. That, that you know we've you know we've gone we've spent a few days before and we come back uh, but I think Milt you said it and maybe you want to talk a little bit about it you know the importance of being able to operate and function out there uh, where you're uh, where you're not going to come back for months you know like the International Space Station. Well, that's right, and and, and uh, it, it it really I can, I personally can hardly imagine that you know we uh, back in the day uh, we thought that the sonic barrier was something that we'd never get past it was a big deal somebody that went supersonic and, and it turns out to be if you know how what how to do it do the right order of damage you're you're there and, and it. And somehow we've got to come in a way to get to warp speed, and I don't know what that means. But but people have a humans have a way of overcoming stuff like that. Yeah. And I was just telling you. Uh, uh, here, here, hold on. Just that we've got now reports out that they only have a few minutes left of work to do before they're ready to pick up polling. And uh, we're also hearing that some of that polling, which kicks off with the mission management team, is also now just about three and a half minutes away. Mm. Now, we are currently still in that hold. But uh, the launch team, NASA, NASA's test director, is uh, continuing to move the team forward. We've wrapped up work um, on the upper stage and the lower stage. You're looking now live inside firing room one where launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson is overseeing her launch team. We've had a number of delays that have put us off the T zero, but we are starting to track to a T zero close to around a quarter till top of the hour but we do need to have some polling that takes place. I'm pausing now because I'm listening in to the teams as they communicate. In this launch window, which we're currently 26 minutes into, and it's two hours long, it runs until 3.04 a.m. Eastern time. We have what's called 40 cutouts. And in those cutouts, 
They range from about a second to about a minute. These are times where they can't launch. These cutouts must be accounted for when determining a new T0. The upper stage of the rocket, which was the last to get ready and configured, just recently, the team cycled the liquid hydrogen valves, which is required. And they are currently working on the LO2 valves, liquid oxygen valves in the upper stage. That work is almost done. We are now a minute and a half away from the pole of the mission management team, which is several minutes before T minus 15 minutes. When that poll starts, we'll get a clearer picture of our T zero. So Milt, who do I need to text go for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Not that guy. NASA, NASA's <laughs> test director has informed the launch team to all switch to a common communication channel. It's called 230, 232. Go, don't go. And what this means is that uh, the entire launch team is now on one channel and all future communication will happen there whereas there are many channels. Now they reduce it down to one. Just heard from NASA test director, Carlos Monge. I'm sorry, Jeff Spaulding. Jeff Spaulding's on, they swapped out. There are currently no constraints to launch. Great news, again, no constraints to launch. They're getting ready to pick up with a pole to determine readiness for launch. While we're waiting here, I, I, I was thinking that as we've gone through this uh, Apollo stuff, and uh, we get exposed to all these unknowns we did. And, and there was always a segment of people that said, you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. And there was a group that said, when you step off of the limb, you're going to sink, you know, so deep in the lunar dust and all of that. And we can't eat in space and we can't do this and that. Uh, and all those things go away when you start working on it. And somehow I, I feel like that, uh, the problem of getting to Mars or further is going to go away when we start addressing okay, it. Okay, NASA uh, test director Jeff Spaulding getting ready to conduct the readiness poll. So we are getting close. Uh, he's, uh, I, We're going to anyway. pull up the audio now so that you can listen in. Please go. And rock. Rock is go. All right. Copy all. And launch director NTD, our launch team is ready to proceed at this time. I copy all NTD. At this time, I will proceed with my poll. And attention on 232. This is the launch director performing the final poll for launch. Verify no constraints and go for launch. EGS program chief engineer. EGS Program Chief Engineer verifies that the EGS, SLS, and Arroyan Program Chief Engineers have no constraints and are go for launch. Copy, Greg. Thank you. EGS, Chief Safety Officer. The EGS uh, CSO verifies the SLS, Orion, and EGS CSOs uh, have no constraints uh, and are go for launch. Copy, John. Thank you. Range weather. 
Weather has no constraints and weather is go for launch. Copy LWO and mission manager. And mission manager, launch director. Launch director, mission manager on 232. The mission management team has been pulled. You have a go to proceed with terminal count and launch of Artemis 1. I copy all. Thank you. And entity, launch director. Go ahead, launch director. Yes, sir. On behalf of all the men and women across our great nation who have worked to bring this hardware together to make this day possible, and for the Artemis generation, this is for you. At this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. Copy, launch director, and thank you. All right, we do have a couple of steps to configure, and then we will be ready to resume the clock. CVSE, NTD. CVSE here. Initiate recording of Orion cameras at this time. In work. R, NTD. RSR here. Form the booster ignition SNA arm rotation enable. NDT, RSR, booster ignition SNA arm and rotation enable is complete. And I copy. Thank you. Okay. So there you heard the poll from launch director. Early. Getting ready to get that new T0 time. The poll that you heard was the NASA test director's poll. And All right, and we have verified no cutouts at this time. And all personnel, we are going to resume the clock. GLS, you can resume the clock on your mark. GLS copies. Countdown clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. GLS mainline has been initiated. Okay. T minus 10 minutes and counting. We are T minus 10 minutes away from liftoff of Artemis 1. As you can see, the clock is now moving. Let's put that up. T minus nine minutes and 47 seconds. The L minus 15 pole complete. Uh, show went 6, 47, 44 is a new liftoff time. Affirm. Okay. Okay, Milt, you're on. <laughs> I've got so excited, I couldn't hardly remember where I was. <laughs> <laughs> the point, I guess my point was simple, that we've gone through a whole lot of stuff in the past and, and it's out there in front of us now that that uh, we think is going to be hard, but somehow when we get there, it's not, or we can make it work, and we do make it work. And I think that's going to happen somehow. Maybe it'll take us a thousand years, like Jerry says, uh, and it may. I don't know. It's uh, to get together to move a planet the population of the planet is, is we only be able to get that many people to agree that they want to go anywhere or, or where they want to go. That's the other thing. Jerry, I'm, I'm of the opinion that the, the population, it, 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 it's kind of solves itself, you know, like the lemmings. You get a while, there's a lot of them. And the rabbits and everybody coyotes and everybody gets fat and then and they eat them all and then there's no food and then they die and then the lemmings start back in again. So uh, I don't know how to explain that theory, but but that's the way it seems to me that that, that nature can only deal with so much and and it has a way of uh, self-adjusting. I guess I could I, way I say it, think of it. You know, but, I know what you're talking and. There have been people that, in fact, some people we know um, have said that maybe the first mission to Mars will just be one way, establish a habitat once you know how to do that on the moon, where it's closer and you can uh, work it out, is go on to Mars and set up a colony so you can do another leap sometime in the future. Now, what I think, what I think will happen is we've got, and boy, we're getting off the of Artemis here a little bit, but I think we've, I think we've got to find a place that would sustain human life, and go for it, 
right away with permanent facilities and one-way trips to volunteers to start and not try to move a bunch of people, just move um, a few enough to uh, start over. And, uh, but, you know, that's, that's far out thinking. And I just try to think of why are we doing all this? There's got to be a, a pretty big reason for why we're exploring space. And it's our nature, explorations in our DNA, but why? Why are we doing that? It's, I think it's so we can occupy another place someday if we have to. And we might just do it for grill. That's because Rod Serling in the Twilight Zone told us we were supposed to. That's, that's yep. right. Jerry, Jerry, just on your point, Artemis obviously is a big, the case is made for to do all the things you talked about, have the big vision, which is where we should keep striving all the time. And who knows what politicians and budgets get in the way or whatever. But Artemis is important to to get to those next steps, right? Because this is a, it this is, is. A a absolutely. Yeah. And I, and as I said earlier, Artemis is going to have a a sustainability to it that we've never had on the moon. I mean, that is a habitat ultimately with traffic up and down to the gateway and then back to Earth and set up mm -hmm. a real transportation uh, link. So it. And Artemis starts all this, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, vital. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't see the countdown clock. So, but, but I don't either. What you uh, said, what, what, yeah. what you said, Jerry. Though, when you think about the colonization of the United States, that was a one-way trip for people that got on yeah. that boat and came over to to Virginia, and yeah. same thing with. Uh, uh, with Massachusetts, and, and and it's nothing unusual about that. I, they kept pouring people into Virginia for several years, and and half of them died. You know, they didn't survive. Right, and right. That wasn't easy. Now you're right, and and, and you can keep on going up. Uh, well, we're somewhere within within ten minutes. What probably, probably seven minutes out here? We they started. No, no, no. Four 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 thirty nine. It's on the screen now. Oh, there it is now. I said, okay, good. Yeah, it's getting close. Yep. I, I got to tell you, you know, anybody and uh, those of us in the baby boom generation remember this. I, I listening to that polling earlier when they're going around, and when you hear the countdown, we get closer to to uh, launch the liftoff. Um, that brings back a lot of memories. I know it does for you guys when you hear that and you know, you're always waiting. So is somebody going to just uh, be the fly in the ointment, but to hear that come off like that. And, and obviously a very good patriotic moment uh, when you had the launch director mm -hmm. uh, doing kind of a salute to all the people who are making it happen, thinking back to, you know, the Apollo program, 400,000 plus Americans, men and women, you know, all over the country, making it happen around the world for that matter, but especially here. So, what what goes on when you when you heard that? What was happening emotionally? Uh, you know, Milton, you said you got so excited, but just <laughs> quick thoughts. Well, you get excited when you get down to liftoff. But <laughs> you, you were talking talking before about we would sit around worrying about how things were going to go bad, and yeah. we didn't do that. That was that wasn't an option, as as Cran says. Yeah, you know. Uh, uh, Mark, one of the things that's different is in in mission control and Milton know what I'm talking about. Our go no goes um, is what we called them. Uh, they say without constraints or something. They use more words, but they were real crisp. You know, I can still remember the order. You know, it was booster, Fido, guidance. Uh, GNC, ECOM, TELMU, control, surgeon, and network. And it was, it was, uh, okay, give me a go, no go. And we, okay, go or no go. We were always go. Uh, but it, it, the feeling's the same to me. It's, it's an exciting moment. Uh, this is when you're, Adrenaline starts to pump up a little bit. If you're, uh, particularly if you're, it's bad enough just watching it, but when you're working on it, 
the adrenaline really starts pumping about here. Just over two minutes to launch. This is when you this is when you say record us to flight speed. That's right. <laughs> The upper stage has gone to internal power. So power is removed from the rocket's upper stage, the ICPS, and it's been switched to battery power. The same milestone is coming up for the core stage at T minus one minute and 30 seconds. It's kind of like the old Jules Verne, you know, science fiction, you know, when they uh, would say ramming speed, I never knew what ramming speed was. <laughs> <laughs> DLS yeah. go for core stage to internal power. The rocket's core stage, which houses the three flight computers, is now on battery power. So there is no more hold time available because there's no more margin on the battery. So if we hold, have a hold, we'd have to recycle back to T minus 10 minutes and recharge those batteries. Don't do that. The count continues. Okay. It's a going. note now, shortly after liftoff. One minute. Shortly after liftoff, Mission Control Houston will take control of the rocket, and my colleague, Leah Cheshire, will take over commentary. T-minus 50 seconds and counting. Coming up at T-minus 33 seconds, the GLS will hand off control to the ALS. This is the autonomous launch sequencer. On board the rocket, it will take over command and control of the rocket. But the ALS will check, make sure there's no holds coming from the ground up until T-minus GLS, seconds. go for ALS. And we are go for ALS. The Space Launch System is now counting down to lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. This launch team can no longer recycle the count. Water. Sound suppressor water now 15. flowing under the ML. And here we go. Ten. Hydrogen oh. burn off igniters <clears throat> initiate. Seven, six, five, four stage engines start. Three, two, one. Boosters and ignition and liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. Woo! Wow. All far. <laughs> yeah, goosebumps. All four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. First time in almost 50 years to the moon. Carrying good con good control on the roll from teams in Mission Control Houston. All good calls so far. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. First milestone will be for the vehicle to pass through max Q at about one minute and nine seconds into launch. This is the greatest period of atmospheric force on the rocket. SLS now travel 607 miles per hour. Gorgeous. You're looking at 8.8 .8 million pounds of maximum thrust quiet here in the loops of mission control. Four core stage engines throttling down and pass on your max Q. Looks like a cell phone with a flashlight on. <laughs> can imagine how this looks all now over the one space. Minute, 21 seconds into Florida. the flight, traveling at 1,420 miles per hour. The four core stage engines are back at maximum thrust. Starting to haul the mail now. The next major milestone will be for the solid rocket boosters to cut off and jettison about two minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, so about 30 seconds from now. Again, quiet here in Mission Control Houston as teams continue monitoring the flight of Artemis 1. We're now 16 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center, traveling over 2,800 miles per hour. Solids. Solids are off. Standing by for solid rocket booster jettison and shortly thereafter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Feels like the space shuttle at that point. Yep. Confirmation that the solid rocket boosters have separated these 177 foot boosters. Now the core stage continues to power the flight of Orion, all four RS-25 engines firing, traveling over 3,400 miles per hour, 46 miles downrange. Some of those shuttle engines, as you pointed out, Jerry. Two minutes and 36 seconds yes, into the flight. Hearing nominal calls here in Mission Control Houston. <clears throat> 
It's two We've million still got four good engines trust. on the core stage. Next up, we'll be looking for the service module fairing to separate. This is three 15 by 15 foot fairing panels, providing structural support, protecting the service module. Those will separate at about three minutes and 11 seconds into flight, and very shortly thereafter will be followed by the launch abort system separation. Just over three minutes into the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 4,060 miles per hour, 83 miles downrange. We just had confirmation that the service module fairing has separated. Okay. And that the launch abort system pyros have fired, separating those from Orion as well. For future crew members. That's we just heard the call for three engine press, meaning if SLS were to lose an engine at this point in the mission, we could still achieve a nominal mission. We would just have an extended main engine cutoff time. However, we still have four good engines all at maximum thrust right now, powering the first flight of Artemis at 5,200 miles per hour, 148 miles downrange. You know, we were talking about why we do this. And uh, we talked about the science fiction element. Uh, I think that uh, to some degree- We're four degree... minutes and 16 seconds into the flight of Artemis One. So far, we've had a clean ascent. We saw those solid rocket boosters jettison about two minutes and 11 seconds after liftoff. Shortly after we had the service module pairing, panels fairing separate, as well as the launch abort system. The launch abort system was inert for this flight, except to perform this separation. Those that, four core stage engines will continue to fire and power the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 6,800 miles per hour, 229 miles downrange. Booster flight controller reports that the engines are looking good. That we gain something from making science fiction real. Yep. Our core stage main engine cutoff time is about eight minutes and three seconds. We are now at five minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, 7,656 7, miles per hour. Again, four good core stage engines, those four RS-25 engines. The last time those core stage engines flew, they were taking space shuttles to orbit, and now with upgraded capabilities, they're launching the future of human spaceflight. Five minutes, 42 seconds into the mission. We are now traveling 8,800 miles per hour, 345 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. Again, we are anticipating core stage main engine cutoff at about eight minutes and three seconds. And about 10 seconds later, we'll see core stage separation at which point Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will be flying free. Now traveling over 10,000 miles per hour, six minutes and 15 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1, 427 miles downrange. Quiet here on the loops in Mission Control Houston. Teams continue to monitor this first flight. How quickly you moved from 6,000 to 8,000 to 10,000 in terms of the speed. Amazing. So we've uh, we've cut the audio for a, for a short time here. Um, Milt, okay, uh, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that it doesn't look like the engines are big enough for that stack, but I don't know anything about it. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that's pretty smooth. <laughs> well, it seems so because, uh, you know, as we know, the, uh, the new SLS is uh, a little bit shorter, okay, but uh, certainly more powerful, you know, than Apollo 5 and, uh, or Saturn 5. And, um, uh, it seems to be well powered to, you know, for the mission. It seems like they've made a lot of, you know, great changes and upgrades. Uh, and one thing yeah, I haven't uh, noticed, by the way, I haven't seen any slide rules, okay, in mission control. <laughs> <coughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't see any slide rules when I was in there. <laughs> you know, the uh, I, it's been so long since the shuttle launch. 
I forgot how more comfortable it felt once those solids got off of there. Um, you know, they're, you can't shut them off. And uh, if they go wrong, they go wrong. Um, and I've always, every shuttle mission I watch, <clears throat> when the solids came off, I breathed a little easier. So we're, uh, you know, we're not going to keep you up uh, much later than this. So, uh, you know, for Milton, Jerry, you know, can you describe, well, you can see that uh, they're giving a graphic of, of you know, what's going to happen. And, and uh, you mentioned that TLI will be somewhere, you know, in one to two hours from now. About, and two, about two hours. Okay. Um, and, how, long, how long is it before the uh, solar panels come out? I think almost, sure. I've got the timeline. That's at uh, roughly 18 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, 18, 18 minutes. So that's, that's close, isn't it? We seeing Ruben on the screen there. That's a nice shot of Ruben who's behind the scenes. Yeah. He's the next astronaut to go. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a floating head. It's He's amazing. Championing the cause. He's been making it happen. Well, Thanks. so what's okay? So yeah. TLI that means basically we're we're heading out. We're going to the moon. That's right. And that there's an engine um, right at the back of that graphic that will burn. That's the one that'll burn for 18 minutes um, to shove it, give it enough velocity. It's an Earth orbit. Now, although they do one maneuver to raise perigee here, it's very short. And I, I can't figure out why they do that, other than the fact that they didn't have quite enough power to get it, get it where they wanted it. Because that should have, you know, the cutoff is the way we, when we cut off the Saturn, we were in the right orbit uh, to do, we didn't have to do anything else in Earth orbit. Um, but they're gonna burn this thing, the, the graphic that's showing now, they're gonna burn, I think it's about two minutes or three minutes. And, uh, and then they'll, they'll be ready to do TLI after that. Well, um, I would thank you for joining us. Um, you know, I think, uh, as we uh, kind of monitor the uh, mission, if we see, you know, some exciting times, we'd love to invite you back and, uh, and maybe Gene can join us also. But, uh, uh, but Milton, Jerry, um, your perspective is just, it's really thrilling because, uh, you know, once again, there, there isn't anything that they would have encountered this evening that you haven't encountered multiple times, including, as we've talked about the delays, uh, going back to the Apollo 1 fire, you know, Apollo 13. Um, and uh, uh, we appreciate what you have done and the pathway that you have led and others, you know, the entire team to where we are today. So uh, I'm going to give you a, you know, a big clap and, and all that and say thank you very much. Mm -hmm. well, Splashdown would, splash would be a big deal. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Several days. You know, if this, if this goes well, it, the mission lasts twenty six days, so uh, you know there could be some fun to be had yet. Well, um, speaking of us, with fun and the challenges, obviously. But one of the things we haven't mentioned, and I'd almost forgotten about this, you know, since there's no crew on board, they did put that uh, that Snoopy plush toy as a zero gravity indicator. So at some point. You know, like, it's like when Elon Musk did his thing and sent a Tesla with a mannequin in, on, a, on a low Earth orbit mission, um, Snoopy will appear and there's a lot of heritage behind that. So that is a fun, fun element as opposed to the stuff that's scary fun with all this yeah. post technologically. So, well, and, right. And we'll take a look at this and uh, and and invite you back. Uh, uh, I want to thank Ruben, you know, from the Air and Space Museum uh, for mastering the technology uh, Milt, this is the best connection you've had with us, and that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I'll try to work on if it happens again. I'll try to get a a better uh, 
uh, light on my face. Uh, right. But I, you right. can't tell I'm here. Yep. <laughs> That's good. Oh. Well, thanks. Thanks anyway, for having us. Hat, my hat's off to the Armas team. They've, they've, they've done good. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, go for launch USA. And Jerry, I don't, I, don't care who, I don't care who participated in any of this. Um, uh, thanks to the USA and their initiative and what we do as a people and as a country. And um, with people like you, we're going to maintain that leadership. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen.